Hello ladies and gentlemen of the internet. Welcome back. This week we are going to sculpt another maquette. I've spoken a lot about why I like doing these and perhaps I will again later in this video, but for now, let's let's just get to it. Before I sculpt anything, I have to construct the armature so that there is something to support the weight of my clay sculpture. I'll be using plumber's piping to suspend the aluminum armature wire through the head. This gives me leeway as far as how long the legs end up being, how tall the ends, the base ends up being, etc. It's a good flexible foundation. As I'm starting out here, I have no idea what this sculpture is going to end up looking like really. I have an idea for scale and, and there's one particular thing that I'm certain of, but that's about it. We'll get to some of that later on though. I have some thin square wire that I bend over itself and then twist the middle, locking the armature wire together. This twisted part ends up being my torso. I then cut the top where the wires meet and this is my arms and legs. Pretty straightforward and not my original design at all. I don't know who came up with it, but I learned it from watching a demo that Joe Duchel did many 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 years ago. The arms and legs need some help to make sure clay will grab onto them properly and not slide around on the armature. To ensure this, I wrap the armature in a thinner aluminum wire, which is round, not that it really matters. But The torso doesn't really need to be wrapped as the twist will hold, hold on to the clay well on its own. So for the torso I don't wrap anything. Then I use another piece of wire attach it to the T fitting at the top of my plumber's piping support and attach the armature using a hose clamp and a zip tie. Now that it's all secured together, I can begin sculpting. The legs will eventually get stuck into a base of clay, which will take care of the armature swinging and swinging around and, and moving around and dancing on us so much. Once the armature of the torso is covered in clay, I start off by orienting my armature to my bony structures, which I've talked about in other videos too. This is so that the top of the rib cage lines up with where the head armature is sticking out, and so that the clay is fairly well centered on the armature. It matters a lot less in a small scale like this, but in larger scale where the weight of the clay can become quite a lot, it is very important to have equal distribution on both sides of your armature. I draw a straight line representing the rib cage and a straight line representing the pelvis, the center line of my rib cage and pelvis. I'll also draw a horizontal line 90 degrees to the center line of the pelvis to indicate the tilt of my pelvis. As the figure will be standing in, in a version, some sort of a contrapposto, meaning that all of his weight will be on one leg the pelvis will tilt and I indicate that tilt with this horizontal line. This is a pretty standard pose that pretty much instantly reads as dynamic even though it's the pose of someone just standing still. It has movement and believability built into it. And we can thank the ancient Greeks for coming up with this for us. You'll see later on how I convert this contrapposto into, into something a little bit more gruesome and, and wicked. I'll also orient the armature of the stand leg to be directly under where I believe the pit of the neck to be. Pit of the neck is at the top of the ribcage, we've talked about that in another video as well, there's a link in the top right corner. Having the stand leg ankle directly underneath the pit of the neck is another pretty simple rule you can use to create a nice contrapposto if you are working without a model from imagination, which is what I'm doing here. Later on, you'll see me connect the front and the back using these very same center lines that I establish here. And this is vital for a somewhat successful figure. If the front and the back are offset from each other, that's obviously a problem. Our figure would then exist at two places at the same point in time, which would be an issue for any living being. 
And since we're attempting to create something at least resembling a living being here, it's important to make sure the front and the back lines up well. Once the center line of the two bony masses, the pelvis and the rib cage, has been established well, and the tilt of my pelvis has been established, we begin blocking in the sculpture at a furious pace. Actually, I would always recommend not blocking things in at a furious pace, but with patience. But things are obviously sped up here, so that's why I, that's why we're blocking things in at a furious pace. In real life, it took a long time. This, I think, is a good time to mention Patreon. If you're interested in learning sculpture from me personally and get feedback on your work either on email or via video chat, my Patreon page is the place for you. You'll get in-depth feedback on techniques and how you can apply them to your own work. Anything sculpture related goes. We can talk about armatures, supplies, mold making, anything you need help with in your sculpting endeavors. You'll also get 25% off on my web store, plus accumulated credits equal to the amount you pledge that can be used for further discounts in the web store. So check it out, there's a link in the description below. As with any sculpture I make, I start with what's most important to me, and for me, that's almost always the torso and the stand leg. They will be the most instrumental in creating a well-balanced, well-gestured figure. And these two elements of the figure are the most vital in terms of creating a structurally sound figure. Which is what I always attempt, of course. I keep in mind that widths are forgiving and easily adjustable, and heights are not. So I try to build a figure that is a little bit too narrow, but has the correct heights. However, I'm not extremely precious with something like this. Good proportions is not what I'm after here. I'm not even necessarily after good structure, to be honest. The whole point of a maquette for me is to create a design template. To bring an idea to life so I can see if I like the ways, the way the arms are bending this way or that way. If I like the way the balance like knee is aiming in or out. If I like the way the head is looking up or down. Essentially the big strokes that not only make up the gesture of the main body, but also the supporting elements such as head, arms and balance leg working together with the two structurally important elements. Are my legs a little too short? It's not, it's not really an issue for me, not in this maquette. Are the symmetry on either side of my center line of my rib cage not working perfectly? Again, it's not an issue. All these issues are solved later in a larger scale piece. A piece such as this is more about the visceral visual impact. Is the anatomy not 100% accurate? Not an issue. My model will provide me with a lot of the things a maquette like this is missing. So whenever I make a larger scale model, larger scale sculpture and use my model, that's when all those things will get solved and created in a convincing fashion. Essentially, I allow other things to come into focus when working without a model. Because I gloss over so many aspects of figure sculpture that I normally wouldn't gloss over, it allows me to work very fast as well. Instead of spending months on a sculpture focusing on every aspect of creating a good figure sculpture, I get to spend a few hours. Something like this sculpture takes me maybe six hours over the course of a few days. I try to only sculpt a few hours at the time as I find my, my energy runs out real quick. Usually I'll spend the day sculpting for a few hours and editing or writing a video or making molds and casts for the rest of the hours. Especially when working from life, I find my focus is limited and I get tired quickly. Three hours of model time per day is, is more than enough for me to get tired. I do focus real hard whenever I have a model because the cost of the model comes out of my own pocket. I'm not in school anymore and if I do work on my sculpture while not looking at the model, comparing the model to the sculpture, it's a waste of money. And looking at the model and comparing model to sculpture requires a massive amount of brain power. 
and I have read, though don't quote me on this, that the brain drains calories real fast. It takes a lot of energy. And maybe, maybe that's why I'm skinny, because I think all the time. Thinking. That's my excuse for being skinny and for eating whatever I want, whenever I want. This maquette is for a sculpture of a character from Dante's Divine Comedy. From the part where Dante and Virgil are heading down into the circles of hell, which is the first part of the book, the inferno part. In Canto 20, or, or chapter 20, they enter the eighth circle, Bolgia 4, and meet the fortune tellers and soothsayers, people who have attempted to penetrate the future. And they are punished for this by having their heads turned backwards and they are walking backwards for eternity. Which is a pretty shitty way to spend eternity. But at the same time, it's a really, it's a really metal visual. I really like it. Now their bodies are distorted in all kinds of fashion. And we meet a bunch of people here. And one of my favorites is Michael Scott. Which is, it's, it's weird. This is a book from the 1300s, written by an Italian, and there's a guy named Michael Scott. He's a Scottish mathematician, and he's perceived to be a magician, and that's why he's there. Which is, to me, completely baffling, but whatever. I'm not sculpting any spe specific character that we meet in, in the Divine Comedy. The sculpture depicts, depicts an unnamed character wandering backwards through the Eighth Circle. Something about bodily distortion is very interesting to me. And it will also force me to come up with a convincing way to turn someone's head backwards. I'll also distort the legs and feet and one arm will kind of unnaturally twist around itself. So there's a lot of stuff here where I have to make things up a little bit. Which I, I think is very very interesting. Looking at people doing creature effects and creature sculptures for Hollywood and makeup effects, makeup sculpture for Hollywood was, was kind of how I got interested in doing sculpture in the first place. So it feels really refreshing and a lot of fun to kind of go back to some of that and try to make it as convincing as possible. Essentially trying to blend makeup effects and Hollywood sculpture with fine art in a way. Not that I really think that there's that much, much of a difference in between them, honestly, but it's fun to try and blend different worlds together, essentially. I've wanted to sculpt someone from Dante's Inferno for a really, really long time. Maybe since around 2013, when I first read the book on a beach in Mallorca. So it's really exciting to finally get to it, you know, finally getting around to it. And and we'll see, this sculpture might never turn into anything, because I, I have a very specific look that I want, I have a very specific model, a, bo a very specific body type that I'm looking for, and if I can't find a model that suits that, I'm just not going to make the sculpture. And, and where am I going to find a model anyways, who can do all the things that I want this sculpture to be doing? I mean, I'm pretty sure I won't be able to find one haven't met anyone who can turn their head completely backwards yet. But I think piecing to the human figure together from many separate poses and many separate views is, is a challenge that I enjoy immensely. And, and I've already undertaken this challenge a little bit in my latest project, the PT project. Here I've made, in this project, I've made all kinds of executive decisions on the gesture and the position of the body, the position of the leg, feet. But this sculpture would be a huge step forward in that direction. And I'm just not entirely sure that I'm up for it yet. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff here. You can get away with a lot in a small scale maquette like this. But if this was to be, you know, three quarter or a life size sculpture, things would be a lot more difficult. It would not be as forgiving as this small scale. I hold my larger works to a different standard than these small maquettes. 
They need to be convincing in all aspects. That's how I enjoy making them and that's what my natural inclination is and I don't want to diverge from that for any specific reason. I don't want to copy some other style. I want to kind of do what feels natural to me. This small scale maquette allows me to explore the idea without committing large amounts of energy towards creating a realistic image of a twisted, distorted sinner. As I mentioned, there's also a certain body type I'm after, one that's really long, lean and slender, yet muscular, and that can be really hard to come by as well. It's a body type that seems to be less prevalent these days than perhaps what it used to be a few hundred years ago when people had to work the land from a young age and didn't play Fortnite five, hour, five hours a day. Not that I'm against video games, actually, I, I love video games. And I certainly don't want to be working the land. I just wish that there was someone out there that did work the land, and that they could come model for me. Okay, that's it for episode one. This sculpture will be broken down into two episodes, I'm pretty sure of it. Probably not three, definitely two actually. I wanted you guys to be able to see clearly what's going on, and if I speed the footage up too much, you kind of can't. This is already sped up quite a bit. So I hope you're okay with, with two episodes. Next time we'll hopefully and certainly, no, not hopefully, certainly be more exciting I hope, with the backwards head being added. It certainly was exciting for me to, to figure out how to turn someone's neck around in a convincing fashion, and I think I was able to do it. If you're like me, and you can't wait for anything, you can check out the finished sculpture on my Instagram page. There's a link in the description below. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Eirik and welcome back into my studio. With some hot coffee in my system, it's time to get back to sculpting the Dante's Inferno maquette. This is part 2, so if you haven't checked out part 1, in case you missed it, the link's below and in the top right corner. So first thing for me always in the morning is, once I get to the studio that is, I, I always get coffee. We have a very fine cafe here at the school called the FAA Cafe, which is a lovely name and it has two lovely ladies working in it who make us any coffee drinks that we would like. Obviously not for free. I'm usually a cappuccino guy, but in the morning for some reason I'm, I'm very eager to get to work, so cappuccino is no good. Can't have cappuccino in a paper cup. That's just a mess and it's plain wrong. So in the morning I have regular black drip coffee, also known as American coffee in a paper cup. Which means I can go directly to the studio and get to work instantly. Okay, let's talk about some sculpting. I build the head in this maquette the same way I would on a regular sculpture, on a larger scale sculpture, that is. Except that in this one, there is the slight issue of figuring out how to put someone's head on backwards in a convincing fashion. When I was a kid, the, the internet was fairly young, I guess, probably even less than 10 years, and there was a lot of weird things on it. Of course, there's still a lot of weird things on it, but somehow it felt a little bit wilder and weirder back then. I guess maybe because it's new, who knows. There was this disgusting website called Rotten.com. By the way, do not visit Rotten.com, they don't deserve the traffic, even if they're still around. Rotten.com was filled to the brim with awful photos of terrible accidents and when I was a kid we would go on the school computer and dare each other to look at these horrific images of humans chopped to pieces by helicopter blades and all other kinds of awful shit. And I would always chicken out instantly, every time to the amusement of someone else. 
So when sculpting this particular sculpture, I decided not to google human head turn backwards in case Rotten.com or some other heinous website would surface and give me nightmares for years to come. So I had to make it up. And I didn't want it to be ambiguous either. The face, hands and the feet and several other anatomical details I'm willing to leave very unfinished in a maquette like this. But the anatomy around the backwards facing head was important to have fully realized and convincing. So I can use this maquette in the future to reference from and not have to come up with something completely new in a larger scale version. It's a lot easier to go back and forth and make edits in the design in smaller scales of course. So to do this I considered the muscles that attach the head to the body carefully, the neck muscles. There are four major ones and then one that's not really a muscle but that does a shape that takes up space. Two of the four muscles are the two sternocleidomastoid muscles and I might have butchered that name, I'm not sure how to say it in English. They run from inside or medial in anatomical terms or inside if you're not medical or anatomical, the inside part of the clavicles to behind the ears. They're the, they're the two kind of thick bands that run up along the neck. These two muscle turn the head. I'm sure they do other stuff as well, by the way. My anatomy knowledge isn't off the charts or, or anything like that. Anyways, those are two of the four. The last two are the trapezius muscles. Those are the ones that are kind of part of the back and then they attach to the bottom of the skull in the back. And then there's the part that holds the Adam's apple. Now I don't know what this part is called exactly sadly, but you know which part I'm talking about I think. So there are five forms that I'm considering when spinning this head backwards. I want to make sure all the muscles and the Adam's apple is attached where they are supposed to be attached and that they stretch and twist in unnatural fashion from their origin to reach their insertion points. That does mean that in certain areas there will be a lot of compression and in those areas I did cheat a little bit and simplified some of the folds, brought several of them together into a larger fold. In this scale a lot of really thin, wispy, skinny forms don't read very well, it doesn't look very good visually. That, and I think that's kind of the case for sculpture in general, in general. Really thin, weak shapes usually don't look too good. You want thicker and fuller forms, usually. They might not be there in real life and you might have to bring a few weak shapes together into one strong one, but it's often worth it as it, as it tends to look a little bit better, I think, especially in smaller sca scales like this. I also did my best to envision how turning your head backwards would affect the position of the head, the tilt of the head. You'll see the head is tilted a little bit sideways and this is on purpose. I imagined that as the muscles got pulled tight and stretched beyond their limit, they would pull on the skull and tilt the head a little bit. I think it also adds to the feeling of tension perhaps. And another thing that it is important to get right that I've seen several people get wrong, speaking of tension, is what happens to muscles when they are not in tension, when they are not pulled tight. I guess I don't know the, the opposite word for something that's not pulled tight or something not being in tension. But you get the idea. So what, what tends to happen is that muscles that are being compressed to even to the extreme will, will blob up and, and compress. They become short and fat. They won't buckle and twist like a soft spaghetti. I've seen several people treat muscles compressed more than natural do this and it stops being a muscle at that point. It stops appearing as a muscle visually to us and it starts appearing as something else. I'm not sure, even sure what it does appear like but it doesn't look very natural. Now I'm not sure if muscles compressed beyond how far they should be compressed do buckle like wet noodles but when sculpted in this fashion they certainly don't visually look like muscles anymore. So instead of having them twist and buckle in on themselves like a soggy piece of bread, make sure 
they compress and swell, like when you flex your biceps for example, becoming shorter and thicker. Just something to keep in mind when creating anatomy moving in unnatural ways, if you happen to be doing that one day. This I think is a good time to mention Patreon. If you're interested in learning sculpture from me personally and get feedback on your work either on email or via video chat, my Patreon page is the place for you. You'll get in-depth feedback on techniques and how you can apply them to your own work. Anything sculpture related goes, we can talk about armatures, supplies, mold making, anything you need help with in your sculpting endeavors. Check it out, the link is in the description below. Another unnatural element worth talking about is the right arm on our left. I wanted to let it twist more than an arm should, and more than an arm can, really. There's nothing in Dante's Inferno, the book that's the inspiration for this sculpture, talking about arms being twisted around, especially not of this fortune teller. But I thought it would be an interesting opportunity to add some drama and perhaps interest. Because the head is on backwards, this does give him the arm, thus having the arm this way, does give him the feeling of stretching backwards in an unnatural way, reaching behind him to perhaps steady himself or, or to like feel what's, what's out there or something like that. Even though there are natural ways to reach out behind you, the, doing it this way I think adds to the nightmarish quality of the sculpture. Like with the head, I considered the natural anatomy and its origin and insertion when doing this. I turned the elbow inwards towards the body just enough to where it looks kind of broken, like it's twisted more than it naturally should. Like you shouldn't be able to twist your elbow inwards this far. And then I twisted the wrist on top of that even more. And the end result is an arm that twists more than it naturally should, almost like somebody has grabbed it and just twisted it until it kind of broke or something like that. Yet the anatomy is, is fairly convincing because it's attached, its origin and insertion are all in the correct places, more or less. So it reads naturally, even though it kind of looks like it was run over by a car or something like that. I think these sorts of modifications are a lot of fun and it's very interesting to see how far your knowledge of anatomy can be pushed, how much you can actually do to the figure before it falls apart and stops being convincingly real. Not that I'm able to make something convincingly real in this scale anyways, but if this were to be made in a larger scale, I think I could at least begin to approach a realistic result in a very convincing fashion. And we'll see, I don't know yet, but maybe this monster makes it into large scale one day. It would be a challenge for sure, and hopefully a lot of fun. So what you are watching about at this point is what I would consider a fairly decent blocking for a maquette that is. Most of the information I'm after is here or there, and I could certainly stop here at this point and be satisfied with the end result. But I want to push a little further and this is where mushing clay in between what I've set up already comes into play. You might have seen me model very much in the same fashion in my larger scale work and there's links all over this video to those videos so check those out. Once all the forms are there you can use clay to fill the gaps in between your setup. In larger scale, there's a ton of work to do in the gaps in between the forms, the transition areas, your areas of rest. There's a lot of work there and a lot of information that's kind of hidden in there. But in a scale like this, in a maquette, a lot of that work can just be glossed over. Because of the scale as mentioned and because of the finish that I'm after. So technically, what's the best way to go about that? So I'm using oil-based clay here, and oil-based clay needs to be heated up, at least if you want to work in a timely fashion. The clay I am using is called Chavant Le Beau Touche, and I think it's, 
I don't know. I think it's the medium one and it's pretty soft right out of the package. But it's hard enough to the point where it needs to be heated for the process to be sped up a bit. Especially if you're used to water-based clay, which I am. This then dovetails nicely into the step I'm at right now, because with most of the clay up there and in the right place, all I need to do is to fill the gaps with clay without moving the clay that's already up there. So my sculpture that's been sitting up there for a while has gotten a lot cooler. And so the clay is cold and hard and doesn't move very easily, which is fine by me. I take warm heated clay, that's been freshly heated of course, and I push it into all the gaps. The cold clay is hard and stays put, while the warm clay is easily mushes into the right places, as it is a lot more malleable. Now if this sculpture was made out of terracotta clay, which is the clay I normally use, the same thing applies, but it's in a slightly different fashion. I like to let my clay dry out a bit, meaning the sculpture gets a bit harder. Water-based clay dries out, you know, so I just don't, I just skip spraying my sculpture for a little bit and the surface gets pretty hard, close to kind of a leathery finish. And then the clay on the sculpture won't move easily when pressure is applied. So what I've set up will stay in place and not get mushed around and messed up as I begin to add clay in between the forms. So to model, I can take fresh clay from the bag, which is a lot more moist and malleable and fresh, and press in between the drier pieces of clay on my sculpture. Now it does take some practice to manage your materials in this fashion, but I think it can be really helpful, and once you get good at it and used to it, it'll happen without, without you even noticing. The final step you're about to see me do a little bit later to this sculpture is to go over it with the alcohol torch. And a lot of people have asked me about the alcohol torch, so I talk, I'll talk a little bit about it. My alcohol torch is a buffalo alcohol torch from the Complete Sculptor in New York City, which is a great sculpture supply store. Now, you don't have to use an alcohol torch. You can use a cranberry lake torch or something similar like that those tend to be a little bit more aggressive, which is why I like this one right here. It's very important that you fill your alcohol torch with denatured alcohol or some other clean burning fuel. Now, if you don't use clean burning fuel, your sculpture will get covered in soot. A fuel used for outdoor cooking is usually the way to go, as they burn very cleanly to ensure that the food doesn't get covered in black soot, I guess. So essentially, the alcohol torch is just a creme brulee torch, but it's a lot softer, a lot more easily controlled as you slowly squeeze the bottle to blow air onto that little burning flame. And that'll blow the flame onto your sculpture and melt and soften the clay a little bit. Obviously, this only works on oil-based clay. Don't do this on your water-based clay. Let's talk a bit about perfection versus good enough. I just watched a Casey Neistat video about perfect versus good enough and I got inspired to, to say something about it, as I think it applies here also. There's a famous Voltaire quote that goes something like, perfection is the enemy of good, and Voltaire was a very smart man. It's easy to get caught up in trying to make something perfect. And I'm in the middle of it right now. If you follow me on Instagram, you've probably seen me already talking about this a little bit. And it can be helpful to get caught up in that as you end up pushing your work further than you ever have before. But it can also be harmful as you'll be unable to finish the work and you kind of get stuck. Now to avoid this with maquettes, I give myself a time limit. And that really helps me avoid this trap. I find that the Pareto distribution or 80-20 rule applies quite well to sculpture, as, as well as many other things in life for sure. The first 80% of the work takes 20% of the time, and the last 20% of the work takes 80% of the time. And I find this to be really, really true. Even if the numbers are not perfectly accurate, it's always the first 80% kind of fly by and then you spend forever finishing something. That tends to be the case for me, at least if I want to finish something to a high level. 
On a maquette, I basically do the first 80% of the work in 20% of the time, and then I kind of skip the last part, which leaves me with obviously a very rough unfinished sculpture. Which is okay, I prefer that anyways in maquettes because I want to leave things open-ended when I'm going from a design maquette to a larger scale sculpture, a fully finished sculpture. I don't want my maquette to be fully finished and fully completed, as then the larger scale sculpture kind of becomes like filling in a coloring book, which is not very interesting, at least not to me. The maquette has a purpose to serve, and perfection should not be one of them. At least I don't think so. For me, maquettes are quick and rough sketches. They are there to outline a project, solidify an idea by bringing it into the world. It's not the idea itself represented to the best of your ability. That's the sculpture you're about to make and, and spend months and months on. That's the purpose that, that it serves. That's supposed to be the idea itself represented. The maquette is a design template, a roadmap for what's ahead. Okay, that's it for episode 2 and the final episode of this mini-series on sculpting maquettes. If you made it all the way to the bitter end here, please leave a comment and let me know what you thought. Perhaps mention something that you think can be done better. I hope you enjoyed the video and if you did, I encourage you to check out my Patreon page. I give feedback and critiques on people's work and we talk about whatever you need help with in your sculpting endeavors. So check it out, the link is in the description below. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for a new video next Thursday. There's new videos every Thursday. Subscribe and hit the bell to be notified whenever a new video comes out. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button and share it with your friends and family. It really helps me out a lot. Thank you for watching, stay creative, and I hope to see you in the next one.